You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Useless information. Hi, I'm Steve Silverman, and you're listening to a classic episode of the Useless Information Podcast. This episode, which is titled The Card of Giant, was first released back on October 26th of 2010. As you'll hear in the intro of the story, my wife Mary Jean and I were staying in a cabin in Gilbert Lake State Park, which is about a half-hour drive from Cooperstown, New York. And while most people go there to visit the National Baseball Hall of Fame, I told Mary Jean that I prefer to go to the nearby Farmer's Museum to see the Cardiff Giant. It had been on my list of must-see things for a very, very long time. And it was a few months after that visit that I wrote and recorded this episode. And I have to tell you, it is a great story, although it's one that I would never, ever record today. It's just a little bit too well-known, and I prefer to record more obscure stories. Anyway, enjoy. Welcome to the Useless Information Podcast, my collection of fascinating true stories from the flip side of history. My name is Steve Silverman, and today's story is titled The Cardiff Giant. But before we do that, let's start with today's question of the day. For today's question of the day, I thought I'd ask you a little something about notorious serial killers. Now, I know this is not a pleasant subject to discuss, but back in 1971, the Texas House of Representatives unanimously passed a resolution recognizing the work of one of these evil men. So my question for you today is which serial killer did they commend? And my list is in alphabetical order. The first one was David Berkowitz, who's better known as the Son of Sam. Was it two, Ted Bundy? Three, Jeffrey Dahmer? Four, Albert DeSalvo, a.k.a. the Boston Strangler? Or five, John Wayne Gacy, a.k.a. the Killer Clown? Again, in 1971, the Texas House of Representatives unanimously passed a resolution recognizing the work of one of these serial killers. Was it one, David Berkowitz, the son of Sam, two, Ted Bundy, Bundy, excuse me, three, Jeffrey Dahmer, four, Albert DeSalvo, the Boston Strangler, or five, John Wayne Casey, the killer clown? And as always, I'll leave you uh, in suspense until the end of this podcast, and I'll let you know the answer. And now for today's story on the Cardiff Giant. Now, people who know me very well were you know, really surprised to find out that I took a vacation this summer. It was only the second time in 10 years that I had done so. My wife and I, we stayed in a great little cabin at Gilbert Lake State Park, which is right outside Cooperstown, New York. Now, staying in a cabin may not be considered roughing it by anyone, but I have to tell you, going a whole week without the modern conveniences of microwave ovens, televisions, cell phone reception, and so on, It's just something that I'm not accustomed to. While most people go to Cooperstown to visit the National Baseball Hall of Fame, my destination was very, very different. I told my wife that we had to go see the Cardiff Giant. As crazy as it sounds, this stone man has been on my list of must-see before I die tourist traps for more than a decade, even before I started writing my first book. And since he's now housed at the Farmers Museum in Cooperstown, we had no choice but to pay 12 bucks to get inside. And there he was, in all his rock-solid gypsum glory, there was a Cardiff Giant located right inside the museum entrance. So we just, you know, snapped some pictures, turned around, and left. Well, you not really. Uh, we were pleasantly surprised by the rest of the Farmers Museum, uh, and we spent a few hours there and really wish we had more time, but our schedules... Uh, just didn't allow for it. So now that I've told you about the museum and given you, you know, a two thumbs up review, let me tell you all about the Cardiff Giant. Now, if you don't know the story of the Cardiff Giant, let me begin by saying that he is considered one of the greatest hoaxes ever pulled. And let's just get that detail out of the way. So don't be fooled into thinking he was real for the slightest moment. The Cardiff Giant story begins back in 1866 in Ackley, Iowa. Here we find a cigar maker uh, from Binghamton, New York, named George Hull. And he was there trying to straighten out some business dealings that he had with his brother-in-law. As you know, they say you should never get involved with family. At some point during his visit, he got into a debate with a guy named Reverend Turk, who was a visiting Methodist revivalist. And the two men were, you know, they were at great odds with each other. Turk was discussing that Genesis 6-4 made reference to there were giants in the earth in those days. 
Hull, who was the complete opposite, he was an atheist, was in total disagreement and felt that the statement was not intended for literal interpretation. And that's when the flash of inspiration struck Hull. Why not create a stone giant and try to pass it off as a petrified man, he thought. He was just curious to find out how gullible people could be, and boy, would they prove to be gullible. Two years later, Hull once again made his way back to Iowa and visited the gypsum quarries in Fort Dodge. And that's where he purchased a 12-foot-long solid block of stone to create his dream of a fossilized giant. Hull told the stone guys that that he was purchasing it to make a statue of Abraham Lincoln, you got that, in New York City. Now, due to its immense weight, the stone had to be trimmed down quite a bit along its journey. But it was ultimately delivered to a marble cutter named Edward Burghardt in Chicago. And Burghardt, who didn't know the intended purpose of the statue, worked with two assistants for a few days each week to carve the statue between July and September of 1868. This monster of a man was supposedly modeled after Hull himself, you know, complete with his hair and his beard. But once Hull learned that hair wasn't fossilized, he decided to have it chipped off. Of course, this fossil looked brand new, so they needed to age it a bit. And what they did is they first took a wet sponge uh, with sand in it and rubbed it all over the soft gypsum. But that really didn't do enough, so they then took a large number of darning needles and inserted them into a block of wood and hammered that contraption all over the statue to simulate the pores of human skin. Now, to really make it look authentic, the giant was washed in ink and acid to make it look really, really old. Then came the real trick. You see, fossils should be buried in the ground and then discovered by someone. So Hull needed to do the same. What he did is he arranged for the giant to be shipped across the country to his brother-in-law Stub Newell's farm near Cardiff, New York, hence the title The Cardiff Giant. Now, Cardiff, New York is about 10 miles south of Syracuse. Concealed in a large wooden box, the carving was secretly buried on a dark night and left to age for about a year. Then, on October 16, 1869, Newell arranged for two handymen that he hired to dig a well behind his barn. Now, Newell used a divining stick to show them exactly where to dig the well, and then he left for an appointment in Syracuse. At a depth of about three feet, the men miraculously hit something solid. By the time Newell had returned, a small crowd had gathered around their incredible discovery. Everything was going just as the men had planned. Newell quickly had a tent erected over the fossilized man, and they started charging visitors 50 cents to get a look at the sleeping giant. 50 cents would get you a 15-minute viewing of him, and then, of course, the tent was cleared out and a new group would be admitted. Of course, news spread quickly uh, around the region, and people came from all around to see the Cardiff Giant. On one Sunday alone, 2,600 people paid admission. Now think about it. This is quite the excitement for a town with a population of about 200 people at the time. The Cardiff Giant really was a giant in every way, uh, if you know what I mean. So an improvised fig leaf was made to cover his private parts. Now, while I didn't pull out a ruler when I was there, no, it's not to measure that, uh, he is said to be about 10 feet tall and weigh about 3,000 pounds. Almost immediately, debates started as to what the Cardiff Giant really was. On one side were scientists like James Hall, the famed New York State geologist, and John Boynton, who both concluded that he was not a fossil, but possibly an antiquated statue from another time. These people became known as the statuists, and their opinions were based mostly on the fact that there had been no evidence at the time of the preservation of flesh in fossils. As most uh, people know today, only the hard parts like bones are preserved. On the flip side of the issue were the petrifactionists, typically amateur scientists that believed that the skin had been petrified and then turned to stone, which is what petrification is. Uh, They dismissed the idea that the skin could not be preserved and argued that the giant lacked the pedestal or base that all other statues are known to have. The press, which had been benefiting from this increased circulation that the Cardiff Giant created, clearly went out of their way to side with these petrifactionists. 
while few people had the scientific education needed to determine whether the Cardiff giant was authentic or not, the completion of the Erie Canal in 1825 had sparked a great interest in fossils in general, and the Cardiff giant was no exception. It just seemed like interest in the giant was growing exponentially after this discovery, and you couldn't keep the crowds away. So on October 23, 1869, a week after Newell's shocking discovery, he sold three-quarter interest in the Cardiff giant to a group of investors for $30,000. Now, having already made $12,000 from the exhibit, they lifted the giant from the ground on November 5th and shipped him off to Syracuse to be seen by an even larger audience and, of course, even more cash. Not only was the giant a cash cow for the promoters, the attraction was also a real bonus to the city of Syracuse. The New York Central Railroad arranged for a 10-minute stop right across the street so passengers could make a quick visit. This also meant that the tourists stayed in Syracuse hotels, ate their meals, purchased souvenirs, shopped in their stores, and you know, so on. Newspaper sales skyrocketed as the readers eagerly awaited news stories on the Cardiff Giant each day. And if new information wasn't available, they simply made it up. For example, the New York Herald did an expose based on the deathbed confession of a Syracuse teamster. He revealed that the giant was carved by a Canadian stonecutter in order to, and this is a quote, to rival the fame of Michael Angelo. And that's the end of the quote. So not only was the story a piece of fiction, but as everybody knows, it was Michael Angelo that achieved fame, not Michael Another word, Angelo, Michael Angelo. That's definitely not it. But, like all hoaxes, Newell's story started to unravel. First, Yale paleontologist Othniel C. Marsh, the famed dinosaur hunter, and uh, someone I've actually been thinking about doing a future story on, stated, and this is a quote, it is a very recent origin and a most decided humbug. That's the end of the quote. And of course, that caused statuist Dr. Boynton to take a new look at the statue, and he concluded that the giant was not 250 years old, but more like 250 days old, which was closer to the real truth. And then there were stories from local farmers that remembered a large iron box being shipped to Cardiff from Binghamton. And then Finally, there was a damaging, rep damaging report that Newell had gone to the Onondaga County Bank to have a very, very large draft made in the name of one George Hull. That was the guy that came up with the idea originally. The cat was out of the bag, so to speak. Hull admitted in early December that the whole thing was a hoax. And that group of investors, the ones that had purchased a 75% stake in the attraction, they attempted to quench these rumors and Hull's admission by producing a set of affidavits from experts proving that the iron box could not have contained such a giant. Finally, on February 18, 1870, the two assistant stonecutters that helped carve the giant in the first place confessed to their role in the hoax. Now, you would think that would have been the end of the Cardiff Giant, but in fact, it wasn't. The curiosity factor was still there, and people came from all around to see the stone man. He then went on tour around the northeastern U.S. and generally continued to pull in large crowds. One noted time that he didn't was in New York City. There, the Cardiff Giant was in competition with himself. Uh, well, sort of. You see, P.T. Barnum wanted the giant and had offered that group of investors a very large chunk of change, reported to be in the fifty dollars to $60,000 range, but his offer was turned down. Since he couldn't get his hands on the real Cardiff giant, he decided to have one carved for himself. And Barnum's giant far outsold the, gi the, you know, the original or real giant in ticket sales. Basically, Barnum was showing the fake of the fake, and people ate it up. Of course, the real owners filed a lawsuit against Barnum, but the judge refused to hear the case unless they could prove that the original was genuine, which was impossible to do. Like all sensational stories, people's attention eventually turned elsewhere, and things started to die down. Uh, by the turn of the century, the Cardiff Giant was sitting in long-term storage in a Fitchburg, Massachusetts barn. 
In 1913, he was purchased and then taken back to his place of birth and appeared in various state fairs in Iowa. Then he was purchased by publisher Gardner Cowles to become a conversation piece in his Des Moines, Iowa rumpus room. Now there's a term you don't hear much anymore. And finally, the New York State Historical Association purchased the giant from Cowles in 1947, and it has been on exhibit at the Farmers Museum in Cooperstown since May 19, 1948. A year later, a $100,000 lawsuit was filed against the Farmers Museum by then 38-year-old actor Michael Fitzmaurice of New York City. He claimed that he was the great-grandson of Wesley L. Jukes, who purportedly had carved the card of giant and loaned it to P.T. Barnum. Fitzmaurice demanded the return of the giant to his family. And of course, his lawsuit went nowhere since the giant on display at the Farmers Museum was not the same one that Barnum had arranged to have carved. Now, if you can't get to Cooperstown to see the original card of giant, Barnum's version is on display at Marvin's Marvelous Mechanical Museum in Farmington Hills, Michigan. And if you can't get to that either, there's a full-size replica that was cast from the original giant at Circus World in Baraboo, Wisconsin. Useless, useful, I'll leave that for you to decide. And now for a few words from our retro sponsor. Well, we're afraid Eb and Zeb are heading for more trouble. They can't seem to resist a fast talker or understand elaborately phrased technical claims. But don't ambiguous wordy phrases confuse all of us? Consider gasoline, for instance. Every motorist knows what a good gasoline should do, but few can find a basis of comparison in technical statements of gasoline content. Shell 3 Energy Gasoline is just what the simple, straightforward name implies. A gasoline made entirely of essential energies. When your car refuses to perform, inferior gasoline is at fault nine times out of ten. Shell 3 Energy Gasoline reduces engine waste. A tank full will prove its efficiency. That commercial for Shell Gasoline is from the May 11th, 1932 episode of the Ebb and Zeb radio show, which was titled Installing Gas Pumps. The company name comes from the Shell Transport and Trading Company that was founded in 1833 to import seashells to London. They later realized that there was bigger money to be earned by exporting lamp oil from the Caspian Sea in 1892, and they are credited as having built the first oil tanker, which they called the Murex. Shell Oil itself was founded as the Royal Dutch Shell Group in February of 1907. 60% of the new company went to the Dutch and the remaining 40% to the British. Now, this merge was necessitated to compete with John D. Rockefeller's standard oil behemoth uh, that monopolized the U.S. market at the time. And now for a few totally useless yet totally true tidbits from history. It's time for what I like to call News of the Weird Past. Our first tidbit is dated June 11, 1941, which reported that a 40-foot by 50-foot five-story old brick building suddenly collapsed in Kansas City. Well, it turns out that the building was filled with, get this, 30,000 bushels of popping corn that just started to spontaneously combust. And of course, it expanded and expanded and expanded. Well, you get the idea. So powerful was the force produced that two railroad boxcars were overturned. Our next tidbit dates back to August 11, 1959. It's reported that 67-year-old Florence Hill of Denver, Colorado, was awoken by the sound of her dog boots growling. Uh, She turned on the light and saw a two-inch mouse jumping near her bed. So she opened her mouth to scream, and that was a big mistake because the mouse jumped in and wriggled its way right down her throat. Needless to say, that was the end of the mouse. Her friends convinced her to go to the hospital the next day, and she was released 12 hours later. That really is a true story. Our last little tidbit is dated March 9th, 1987, where it's reported that WTAJ-TV news anchor Brandon Brooks of Altoona, Pennsylvania, did a segment on protective devices you could use to protect your home from thieves. 
but he made the mistake of using his own home to film. And you can guess what's going to happen here. One week later, the thieves broke into his home and stole his television, VCR, furniture, and some other items. Now, it didn't matter that Brooks had installed the double locks and the other devices he recommended uh, in the segment uh, on his windows and doors. The thieves simply smashed the window to get in. And now for the answer to today's question of the day. And I had asked which serial killer received commendation by the Texas House of Representatives in April of 1971. And the answer was choice number four, Albert DeSalvo, who is better known as the Boston Strangler. DeSalvo had admitted to the strangling deaths of 13 Boston women between 1962 and 1964. The Texas House passed a resolution that commended DeSalvo for, and this is a quote, his dedication and devotion to his work in population control. That's the end of that quote. They also commended, it, commended him for, and this is another quote, unselfishly serving his country, his state, and his community. That's the end of that quote. And also that he has been, quote, officially recognized by the state of Massachusetts for his noted activities and unconventional techniques involving population control and applied psychology. That's the end of that quote. Lastly, and here's another quote, this compassionate gentleman's dedication and devotion to his work has enabled the weak and lonely throughout the nation to achieve and maintain a new degree of concern for their future. And that's the end of that quote. Pretty amazing, huh? The chief sponsor of the resolution was House Representative Tom Moore, who just wanted to show that elected officials spend way too much time passing worthless memorials and other legislative proposals that they never bothered to check into. Uh, and we've all seen it on the news. You know, they have giant stacks of paper sitting there that you are sure that they never read. I should point out that this is all done at the beginning of April, as in being an April Fool's joke. Uh, as soon as they passed the commendation, Representative Moore withdrew the resolution because he had proven his point. Now, as I bring this podcast to a close, I really need to apologize for being so late in recording it. I do use the first of each month as my trigger, as my signal uh, to start writing the, po writing the podcast and recording it. But what happened this time is as soon as I finished writing it and got ready to record, I developed, you know, probably the worst case of vertigo I've ever had in my life. For nearly a week, I could hardly stand up straight. Uh, many times I actually did collapse to the floor. And then as soon as I recovered, uh, sadly, there was a sudden death in our family, which occupied even more time. But I hope you enjoyed today's story on the Cardiff Giant. Uh, it's something that I had wanted to see for a very, very long time, as well as our question of the day on the Boston Strangler, listening to our retro sponsor of uh, Shell Gasoline and where the name comes from, as well as the news of the weird past tidbits uh, on popcorn wrecking a storage building, the funny one of the Denver woman that uh, swallowed the mouse, and of course the burglar that robbed the anchorman's home. If you'd like to read more true stories just like these, please be sure to get a copy of one of my books. They are Einstein's Refrigerator and Lindbergh's Artificial Heart. Both are written by me, Steve Silverman, and they're available from your local bookseller, online, and from your local library. I did see that, uh, finally did uh, check it out, that uh, there is a Kindle version of Einstein's Refrigerator available on Amazon if you're interested. Now, if for some reason you'd like to contact me, simply drop me an email at useless at steve.silverman.name. That's useless at steve.silverman.name. Or you can visit my website at uselessinformation.org. That's uselessinformation.org. And I have to apologize also that I didn't respond to the emails I received recently simply because I was out of commission. Uh, lastly, I'd appreciate it if you could log into iTunes as always and uh, leave some positive comments to help increase the number of listeners to this podcast. It really is in the many, many thousands for each episode, and I really do appreciate it. Uh, thanks again for listening, and I hope you tune in the next time. Bye.